Hey guys, welcome to episode two of the Commissioner's Office. Um, we're going to be talking about man coverage in this episode, but before we dive into that, I want to take just a quick minute or two to sort of talk about for each coverage um, how I'll be approaching it. There'll be kind of an overview of each coverage to start off. Um, what are the assignments? What are the formations? Uh, for some of you that are uh, well-versed in football knowledge, you probably aren't going to really learn much new there. Um, but I want to go one step deeper for maybe a couple of you. Um, anyone can look at a play chart and understand where people are going to be standing. Um, but when I kind of talk about what's the philosophy behind each coverage shell, what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses? Then we're going to get into execution and we'll talk about play calling, um, the risk reward of play calling in different scenarios. Um, we'll talk about maybe a couple of pre-snap adjustments and I'll try to throw in some usering tips in terms of how to throw some extra wrinkles into each coverage. And then we're going to get into personnel um, for people that might understand uh, coverage responsibilities at a football level, uh, but may or may not have a great idea of what type of Madden player is really important to make those coverages work best. And that's going to include uh, kind of my philosophy of resource investment. You'll hear me refer to it a number of times. So what that means is uh, for each type of coverage, you have different positions that are your premium positions where you need to uh, be targeting elite athletes. So obviously if we all had unlimited resources, we would have guys that were 99 overall, 99 speed, 99 strength, 99 everything at every position. But I'm going to make the assumption that you're in a reasonably competitive league with 31 other reasonably smart guys, and you're just not going to be able to build a 99 overall team across the board. If you can, that's great. You probably don't need this podcast because you're going to win anyway. Um, so it's important to know that different coverages you really need to invest those premium resources. And by that, I mean your first round picks, uh, maybe early second round picks, um, or maybe you want to give up a premium talent at a position that's not important to get one at a position that's more important for your coverage shell. Um, or free agency. Um, what are the positions where you really should be spending, you know, $15 million a year and chunks of valuable cap space to make sure you get those premium talents at the positions where you actually need premium talents because you really don't need them at every position for every shell. Uh, okay, and with that, let's dive right into main coverage. Um, so there's three primary types of main coverage, um, three variations. First is cover zero. The basic just behind cover zero um, is there's no safety help. Uh, there's no DBs dropping back into deep coverages, no help over the top. It's typically used with press coverage to give the pass rush extra time to reach the quarterback. Um, it's an extremely high risk and high reward defense. Um, it's one that I think is called far too often when I play Madden. Uh, when I'm on offense, I can generally destroy cover zero. It's situationally really effective. We're actually going to be talking with uh, one of the best defensive users in our league a little bit later on this episode. And he does mix in more cover zero, so he can give a different perspective on that one. But the risk reward on that is, is out of control. So you need to not be calling this play when the defense or when the offense is on their own 20 yard line. A single slant can turn into a touchdown. A post is a touchdown. Um, a corner is a touchdown. Um, you have to go into it thinking that. So a good time to call it is instead when they're near your end zone, when they're threatening to score. And so having that 10 yard pass turn into an 80 yard pass is no longer a concern because they're near your end zone. And likewise, the reward of potentially getting a sack could knock them out of field goal range, or it sets them behind schedule in a way that uh, really could mess up their chances of getting a TD. Um, so the strengths, it's obviously going to shut down the run. That's why people run it. And it can actually be effective versus short, quick passes over the middle. Uh, since you have a lot of extra DBs and linebackers sort of running up on the blitz, it just really crowds the middle of the field. As I mentioned before, you're typically in press coverage. So you have that extra, you have that two seconds or so to shut down the, the short passes before guys are eventually going to get free. I mentioned weaknesses. It's incredibly weak versus mid and deep passes. If the offense has time to get it off, a single cut has a chance to go for a touchdown. Um, case in point in the NFL, Demarius Tam Thomas a couple years ago versus Pittsburgh in a playoff game. Tim Tebow threw a wounded duck over the middle. Thomas caught it. There was literally nobody anywhere in sight uh, because he had like two steps on his guy. Uh, breaks a, one single half-ass tackle, and then it's a touchdown in the game. It was like a 70-yard TD. It was just um, a very risky play call, um, and it backfired on him. So as I mentioned, use this when they're near your end zone. But if you are going to run it as a pre-snap adjustment, I really recommend pressing and shading the DBs inside. 
uh, possibly over the top, but really there isn't a single shade that's going to protect you fully. Uh, the reason I recommend shading inside is because it gives you a little bit better shot at preventing that quick slant or the quick in before your extra blitzers can get to the quarterback. The whole point behind a cover zero is that they should not be able to get that post or that corner off in time because you will sack them before they do. If you aren't getting to the quarterback in time, then that's a problem with your pass rush and you probably shouldn't be calling cover zero. But I can understand uh, shading over the top as well. There's probably times for that. It's a little bit more conservative. Um, you're almost certainly going to be more likely to uh, give up that slant. Uh, he won't be in position to stop it, but I think over the top might give you a little bit better odds of preventing that touchdown. So that's cover zero. Um, I don't view cover zero as a base defense, but if you can understand the risk rewards of play calling and sprinkle it in at the right time and not use it as a first down base run stopper, then it can be very effective. So next we have cover one. Um, obviously that's where you have a single safety dropping into a center field, deep blue zone. All right. It's medium risk, high reward it can still be very effective versus the run. And because you have that extra safety that is either blitzing or a safety or a middle linebacker can play that short middle intermediate zone. Uh, they call it robber zone. Um, you often, you'll, I'm sure all of you have seen the play cover one robber. Um, so it's effective versus those short and medium passes over the middle, assuming you're running the variation with that robber zone. Um, it is a little bit higher risk if you're blitzing with that extra guy. Uh, but because you have that safety deep, it will prevent, you know, those five yard slants from turning into TDs the vast majority of the time. But you, so you can give up big chunks of yardage, but you shouldn't be seeing that 70 yard TD. Uh, weaknesses. Uh, obviously, there are some clear cut weaknesses. If they have multiple deep threats, number one, you really are going to have a hard time defending two wide receivers on opposite sides of the field if you don't have the cornerbacks that can hold up in one on one coverage. Uh, so if they, have, if they have two really elite deep threats, um, you should be hesitant to run cover one. And like I said, if you have that extra safety is blitzing instead of dropping in to that short robber zone, then that middle of the field can be vulnerable to short and medium passes. In terms of play calling, I even think this is risky as a base defense, but you can definitely sprinkle this in much more often than cover zero because you do have that free safety playing center field. So use this in times where you can afford to give up a chunk of yardage without giving up a touchdown. You know, this actually isn't the worst thing to call when they're on their own 20, 25 yard line. They've just started to drive, but you might not want to call this when they're on, you know, your 45 yard line and a single 15 to 20 yard gain could put them in field goal range. Maybe you want to contain them and, and keep them out of field goal range. Cover one is particularly effective when you feel like your opponent only has that one legitimate deep threat. You can have that safety over the top that protects you a little bit. Um, you have your rubber zone and you're generally shading your cornerbacks to the outside. The whole idea is that you're funneling the wide receivers into the middle, into your rubber zone, into that deep free safety. Um, in Madden, outside shade is not going to be a guaranteed stop of corner routes or outs. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, in Madden 17, um, I've seen it kind of intimated that um, the the leverage that you choose for your defensive backs is going to be a little bit more effective to that side. So that's my hopes. That's especially why I'm mentioning it. Um, if it does work a little bit better in Madden 17, it's important to know at cover one, you want to shade outside, uh, funnel your funnel, those wide receivers into the middle. Another thing that I would consider doing as a pre-snap adjustment is when you're facing a single deep threat. Um, again, there could be two or three wide receivers on the field, but if, if you've only identified one of them as a guy that you're really worried about going deep, uh, spotlight that wide receiver. I think on Xbox, Xbox One, um, I'm bad at remembering things. It's all muscle memory, but I think it's like Y, uh, then A, and then the, the wide receiver icon, and then A. You can probably Google it or just mess around in practice mode to find it if I don't have it right. Um, but if you do that, if you basically spotlight that, that deep threat wide receiver when you're in cover one, your free safety is in a zone. It's much more likely to kind of hedge to that wide receiver's side, which will kind of effectively be like a double covered when he's on those vertical routes. Um, so again, outside leverage on your cornerbacks. Um, one thing that will do is help contain the out and the corner routes and then your robber zone, which, um, we'll get to in a second. You probably are using it that will help against any inside breaking routes, such as slants or ends. It's not hundred percent. It's not guaranteed. Um, you still want to be pressing. Um, you still need that pass rush to get home, but it's It's, it's a lot more sound than a cover zero. I do recommend using 
whoever's in that rubber zone, it's typically the strong safety, but it sometimes is the middle linebacker with the safety uh, manned up on the running back. Take away those inside wide receiver slants. Uh, that's your primary read because slants are probably the best man beater in Madden. And you have a chance to have your pass rush get to the corner quarterback before those posts get uh, get free. And, I'll, and you have that safety over the top, so posts aren't necessarily a guaranteed uh, win for the offense. If there's nobody coming in over the middle on slants, um, you can either feel free to drop deeper to support any deep ends, or like I said, posts, or, uh, or come up and play short, play underneath to contain those drags. Obviously, that's another route that we see a lot of in Madden. But by the time you've made that read, if you're playing with a fairly fast safety, they're going to get, they're going to connect on the drag, but they're probably only going to get a few yards off of it. To keep things unpredictable, uh, one wrinkle I like to sometimes throw in against players who like to target their tight end often is I will occasionally shade coverage inside and then take my uh, strong safety into kind of a, an outside curl to flat on that tight end side. So instead of a rubber zone over the middle, I'm shading inside um, to get a little bit more support on those slants and ends, but I'm, I'm effectively saying, all right, if they get a slant, they might, they might connect on that, but I think they're going to be looking for their tight end. So I'm, I'm going to shade my, my user player over to that tight end side and, and cover that, that out route or that corner route. So that's cover one. Uh, then finally you have the most common form of man coverage, which is cover two man. The overview uh, here, it's a very balanced, very safe coverage. Um, it's designed to capitalize on favorable coverage matchups while allowing your cornerbacks and your linebackers to play much more aggressively. They have a lot more freedom in terms of how they can play at the very beginning of a play. Uh, your two safeties are dropping back into deep half coverages. Uh, they're your security blankets on the play. That's why your corners and linebackers can play so aggressively. Um, and it's a low risk, medium reward uh, defense, I would, I would say. In Madden 16, I actually ran uh, what ended up being kind of a base man defense. Um, it suits my defensive philosophy. I'm kind of a bend but don't break type of guy. Uh, we'll talk more about risk reward and play calling uh, more, specific, more in more detail in a later episode. Uh, but you'll look, if you run man, you're going to occasionally give up the slants and the drags. Um, you're going to occasionally give up that corner out. When those two safeties are playing back, you can even get run on sometimes. And you may find yourself in, you know, frequent third and short, th third and medium situations. This was a frequent occurrence um, when I played defense. So if you aren't comfortable with the offense being able to pick up those small to medium chunks of yardage almost on demand on a regular basis, then man may not be the best uh, defense for you to play in Madden. Uh, but the flip side of that is I also had a top tier red zone defense and regularly held opponents to field goals and punts. Uh, the idea is uh, when I played defense was that you're going to chip away at me, but eventually one of those third and shorts is going to fail. Eventually one of those third mediums is going to fail. And if I forced you on any given drive to try to convert, you know, five different third downs that my bet was that I could hold you on one of them, even if you were converting, you know, the majority of them. Variations of cover two, man. Again, it's, you'll see a common thread here. It's often used with press coverage, but it doesn't have to be. I'd say on this one, because it's safer, you don't have, you're, you're not as reliant on the pass rush, so you don't really have to use press coverage. I like it. Again, similar to cover one, it's typically used with outside leverage to funnel the wide receivers toward those inside safeties, but you don't have to do the, the outside leverage either. We'll go over that in a second, why well, you might want to switch that up. Um, it's very safe versus deep balls in terms of strengths. Uh, it can defend two to three deep threat wide receivers. I mentioned earlier that that was a weakness of cover one. If they had more than one deep threat, we'll cover two. You can cover two and maybe even three uh, if, if a safety has the speed to get over and kind of cover that whole half of the field. Um, assuming there's no glaring mismatches, uh, your corner, which there shouldn't be or else you probably shouldn't be running a man, uh, but your corners can defend a variety of routes pretty well. And as I mentioned, it allows your corners and linebackers to play more aggressively. They can press the line of uh, scrimmage. They can play underneath. Uh, you can be jumping the ball uh, with corners. Um, you can shade underneath, inside or outside, depending on what routes you want to take away. Um, there's not one size uh, fits all that's going to stop every route. But if you keep mixing up your, your looks and your, and your shading, uh, you might be able to throw off a human quarterback that's expecting a slant or an out to be open because it was the last play and suddenly your corner is shading that side. Uh, the only thing I'd recommend never shading in a cover two man is over the top unless it's like third and 20 or something. Because um, you already have that double safety blanket downfield. There's no reason to double down on that strength. Uh, weaknesses. It can actually be very weak for the uh, versus the run sometimes uh, because you are playing that second safety uh, well off the line of scrimmage. 
Um, it can also be vulnerable to short passes with inside cuts because you don't have that robber zone covering the middle of the field like you do in cover one. Another weakness is athletic pass catching tight ends uh, going up the seams or on post routes or even occasionally on corner routes, you know, are, are, are your cover two killers. Um, we'll go over in a later episode, uh, Tampa two, that was designed as a direct answer to how to stop those pass catching tight ends up the middle. Um, in terms of how to run cover two, the execution, uh, play calling, it is a viable base defense, but it's extremely personnel dependent. We'll talk about personnel in a moment, but realistically you can call this on any down and distance, obviously, to keep the offense guessing, you're going to want to generally mix up your play calling as best as possible. But if this is your base, you know, first and 10, second and 10, um, maybe you don't call it, you know, four times in a row, but, but this can absolutely be your base defense and you mix in cover one at the right time. Maybe you sprinkle in some cover zero, you mix in some zones, some zone blitzes, but, but this can be your base. Um, don't be afraid to use formations on obvious passing downs. Uh, where you're defending the tight end with a cornerback or a safety. I mentioned before that a weakness of cover two man could be a tight end, um, an athletic pass catching tight end. Well, this is not just a Madden thing. It's an NFL thing. Uh, part of the reason why tight ends seem so cheesy and Madden to the vast majority of players is that most Madden players rely on slower linebackers who really are not that good in coverage to guard pass catching tight ends, even on obvious passing downs. Even in the NFL, this would be considered a huge mismatch, and the offense would exploit it over and over and over again. Um, entire defenses have been designed over how to contain tight ends like that. So I really don't think tight ends are as cheesy as most people seem to believe. If you do slap a big cornerback or a safety on a tight end on a third and long, uh, or even third and medium, um, if, you, if you're confident you can stop the run, they do a much better job of containing those tight ends and you'll see a lot of more passes broken up when the quarterback tries to force the ball to tight ends that he's used to being open versus slower linebackers. Really good tight ends, at least in Madden, primarily present problems on early downs because just like in the NFL, this is completely fair. You know, they put a good tight end on the field that can both block a little bit and can is a, is a threat to catch passes, it's pick your poison. You either put a DB on them and you're really vulnerable to the run in a formation that's already vulnerable to the run. You probably don't want to do that on first or second down. Uh, but if you don't, now you have a linebacker on them. So it's an early down punishing of, of mismatches. But don't, don't allow them to dictate that on third down when you can dictate the, ma the matchup. Uh, Pre-snap. Uh, I generally will shade to the opposite area of where you'll be usering. So uh, generally speaking, um, you can... You can shade outside or inside, depending on what you want to do with, with the safety. I, I, I use her safety. Okay. So if I'm going to be using kind of a middle zone or play more inside, I might shade, uh, to the outside. If I'm going to be uh, covering the outside and watching a tight end on that corner route, I might shade my coverage inside shading underneath. I've already said is also fine. If your opponent is hitting you with frequent jags or curls, it won't always stop the drag, but there's a good chance that your guy's going to be right there. If he has the speed to keep up, which. Again, I've said it's personnel dependent. If your corners don't have the speed to keep up, then you probably shouldn't be running man as a base defense. But underneath can even stop the occasional slant. If they're just stepping in front of it, it can be, lead to an interception. Again, don't shade over top. For usering, like I said, I, I typically will user the strong safety. Um, depending on the formation, um, you generally want to read outside in um, when you're using the safety in, in the deep middle. One thing that I see from Madden players is they're hesitant to use your guys in deep blues, which I completely understand. I, I often avoid it myself because if you miss a coverage, that's a touchdown, um, whether it's cover three or man or whatever. Uh, so what I'll do is, is I'm kind of reading outside in and see if anybody's going deep over my half of the field first. If not, then you can move up into a short hook zone uh, to help against flats or in. So this is a little bit more effective than just calling the play and and just letting the, you know, using the defensive line or something is that if nobody's going deep, bring your safety up. But first and foremost, make sure you're not going to get beat deep. Another wrinkle that I can throw in uh, from time to time is when you're facing trips or similar types of lopsided formations, you've probably seen a lot of it. it it's effective in the NFL and it's effective in Madden. I'll sometimes use the weak side safety. So I'll let that strong side safety, the side where you have, you know, three potential receivers, let him be in that deep half, deep blue. Um, he'll generally be able to defend, you know, at least a couple of those receivers on that side if they go for a vertical. Meanwhile, I'm bringing the weak side safety up and starting the playoff in kind of a robber zone. But 
your first read is to make sure that your weak, if they still have a wide receiver on the weak side, let's say you have one guy split out on the weak side and three guys on the strong side, make sure that that one weak side guy isn't going to burn that one cornerback on a deep post and, and go for a touchdown. So that's your first read. Just make sure that he doesn't need help. And then you're able to either drop back deeper and, and watch for posts over the middle or move your safety up and watch for more underneath plays or, or help if, if, a, if they run a slant, maybe he's beat his guy. Um, so it, it allows you to get a little bit more oomph out of those two safeties, and you're also a little bit closer to the line of scrimmage if, in fact, it's a run. Um, another thing you can do, uh, uh, I remember seeing someone on YouTube do a really good job of, of how to use the linebacker uh, when he's covering the halfback. Uh, so you can use that linebacker, the safety that's assigned to cover the halfback. If it's a passing play, uh, the, the running back might be staying in the block, in which case you can, well, you can rush, but I would probably recommend dropping back over the middle into the short robber zone so you can have the best of all worlds. You have your two safeties deep and you're using uh, a robber zone over the middle. Alternatively, the running back might be swinging out to the flats to one of those sides. Um, so you have to at least respect that. You have to at least defend him somewhat, but instead of the AI might be just running to, alongside with him and taking out the flat, you may decide you don't really need to take the flat out entirely so you can drop into a much deeper curl flat where if the tight end or a wide receiver on that side is running a corner, you're deep enough that you can help support that, that you can help prevent that from getting open. And then if they do throw to that running back, you've basically given them a few yards of extra padding. They're probably going get to get a handful of yards out of it. But if you're, you know, if, if it's third and eight, and third and nine, they're going to be sitting in fourth and fourth and four rather than connecting to the corner route and getting a first down. Um, so personnel, when you're running man coverage, I've said a couple of times, it's extremely personnel dependent in Madden, more so than the NFL, almost certainly. Your outside corners are your primary premium positions. This is where you need to be investing your premium resources. I, I would go so far as to consider your top three corners to be starters because you'll need your nickel corner to be able to hold up in man versus their third best wide receiver most most plays and invest appropriately. You don't really need your nickel corner to be as freakish and as, as much of a premier athlete as the outside guys, but you do need them to all three be good. Uh, in terms of attributes that I look for um, on the outside guys, uh, you're looking at minimum 85 plus man coverage. I would say minimum 85 plus without confidence. And realistically, I prefer guys that are a minimum of 90 to 92 man coverage with maximum confidence, higher if you can get it, and 87 plus in press. Um, I don't really feel super confident until I have kind of those attributes. Obviously, the higher the better. Uh, that's where those outside corners are where you want your freakish athletes. This is where you want to be investing your first round draft picks or, you know, surrender a premier player to another position to get that premium cornerback. Uh, you want 90 plus speed, 90 plus agility, 90 plus acceleration. I, I'm kind of notorious in our league for I don't always value speed as much as everybody else because I think you don't need elite speed at every position, uh, but you got to pick your points. And this is one of those things where you really want elite speed. Um, you'll be asking them to press which means if they get beat on the press at the line of scrimmage, you need them to be fast enough to keep up or make up ground in those deep verticals. Um, there's times where I leave my cornerbacks on an island. I was, you know, I talked about earlier how sometimes I'll, I'll take one of the two deep blue zones and kind of play kind of a read react where it's like a hybrid cover one, cover two, just depending on what the offense does. Well, that means you're leaving a, a DB, a cornerback, an outside cornerback on a wide receiver. So they need to be fast enough to be able to keep up. But on the, on the other hand, they're not a cover three cornerback. They also need to be able to make all the cuts for slants, ends, drags, uh, which means they need agility and acceleration to make up that ground and disrupt the pass um, after a wide receiver might have gotten a couple of steps on one of those routes. Um, I have had a number of corners that can disrupt that by just making that extra uh, quick step to get in front of the ball. So again, outside corners, you're looking for guys preferably no shorter than five foot 11. I uh, can go to five foot 10 if they're an otherwise elite athlete, but really you're you don't need the six foot two giant guys because they're not going to be agile enough, most likely. But you really want, I think, you know, ideal is that 5'11 to six foot one. Um, your nickel and dime cornerbacks can be much smaller. Uh, you know, they can be your 5'8, five, 5'9, five, 5'10 five, guys, no problem, because you really aren't going to be leaving them on an island in vertical routes versus elite wide receivers. You're pretty much always going to have a safety over the top um, on a, versus a slot receiver. So unless you regularly plan to match up your dime cornerbacks with tight ends on third and long, you really don't need them to be really big. They also don't need straight up 
you know, top end speed. You don't actually need those guys to be 91, 92, 95 speed. They could be sub 90 speed, um, but they need to have a good agility and acceleration because they're going to be defending a lot of those quick uh, slants from the slots. They're going to think, think of them defending the West Welker of the world. That's what they need to be capable of doing. So, you know, when's the last time you saw a Welker just go deep for 40 yards? It just didn't really happen very often. Uh, so they can be sub 90 speed, but they still need the agility and the acceleration, uh, preferably 90 plus in both. And they still need that man coverage and press. Um, they're not guarding the top guys. So I, I don't think they necessarily need that 90 plus, but I don't feel confident unless I have 85 plus in man coverage and really another 85 plus in press. Higher if you can get it, but uh, that would be kind of what I would call my targets. The next position that's a premium position is your pass rushers. I know this is about coverages and we covered the front seven in the last episode, but your front seven, your coverage is, is intertwined and you need pass rushers if you're going to run a man coverage, ideally more than one. If you give wide receivers and quarterbacks enough time, wide receivers will get open even if you have 93, 95 man coverage. So you need a pass rush that can get to the quarterback before any of them get open. Uh, so those outside linebacker uh, defensive end types who can come off the edge, or if it's third and long, they can play on the line of scrimmage, um, depending on whether you're running a 4-3 or 3-4. It doesn't really matter. It, uh, both of them can run man quite well. Um, it, it does align especially well with a 3-4, though. Um, and you should be comfortable sending, I think, at least four most of the time. I don't necessarily blitz a whole ton, uh, as you could probably tell from my aversion to cover zero, uh, but you don't want to be sitting back in three-man rushes all the time. Um, you want to be able to keep the pressure up and not give those wide receivers opportunities to get open. You'll also want your pass rushers to be a mix of finesse move and power move types. Because keep in mind, when you're playing those two safeties deep, I mentioned that one vulnerability of cover two man is you're a little bit weaker to the run. So if you only load up on lighter, smaller, finesse move, edge rushers, um, you're going to be even weaker to the run <laughs> from a coverage shell that's already kind of weak to the run. So you're going to have a really hard time getting stops. They're going to be just, uh, they won't even be in third and short. They'll be able to convert second and medium too often. Uh, so you really want, you know, uh, pass rushers. You, yeah, you do want your finesse move from your rusher, but you also want your your power move rusher guys that can really shut down the ruts and, and set the edge as well. Um, if you have a specialist that you can rotate in on third down, uh, in obvious passing situations, even better. Um, but the idea is you have to be able to get to the quarterback. Even better. Uh, but the idea is you have to be able to get to the quarterback. So next up, we have X Warrior Monk, aka Troy, coming on board. Uh, the new coach of the 49ers, although he's a big time Steelers fan. Uh, a lot of you know him from Madden 15 and 16. He's one of the top users in our league. Um, he's known for elite defense and running the ball. And the although I'm, I'm sure he's capable of mixing it up, his base defense is man. So what better guy to have on the show uh, talk about man coverage? Troy, welcome, man. How are you? Good. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. I know you run a lot of man and you like man, so I figured you'd be a good good person to get on and talk about man. Can you can you kind of talk for just a moment about kind of why you like man, what what it is like strategically about it that you like um, to run? Well, the big thing about man, I believe in matching athletes up against athletes. Now, obviously, there's certain situations where it's not going to work. But for the most part, I try to put pressure on that quarterback. I mean, if you can get a, a, an average quarterback to make mistakes, especially in Madden, especially in a league where, you know, if if a throw is off, a tipped ball can turn into an interception, I feel like man really provides me the, the options to force turnovers, put pressure on the quarterback. That's really the biggest key for me, putting pressure on the quarterback. Right on. Um, so I kind of went over cover zero, cover one, and cover two man. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm really averse to cover zero but I do see a lot of successful people run cover zero more than I do. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is actually kind of something that you, you like to, to sprinkle in from time to time. Can you, can you talk a little bit about how you pull that off or, or when you call it, like what's your, what's your thought process with that? Well, first off to back up a little bit, when I do run cover zero, I, I'm one of the guys that likes to sit, even if you're going four wide against me, unless there's a major matchup problem, I don't mind going three, four, manning up putting a linebacker on a slot receiver unless again it's a major mismatch um but the the way that i sprinkle in that cover zero again putting pressure on the quarterback is the main focus so 
my adjustments at the at the line of scrimmage have to be right and quick before the ball snaps. Uh, if I mean, if I see a mismatch and it's not there to where I don't think I can't get to the quarterback, obviously audible out of it. The situations where I really try to key on on cover cover zero is is he running the ball? Uh, if he's running the ball and I'm blitzing. I have faith in uh, my middle linebacker skills as a as a user to shadow the running back. If my if the rest of my front seven happen to run by the running back, I feel like I can make that tackle while isolating a cornerback safety on a on a slot, whatever it may be. I, again, athletes versus athletes. I don't mind stacking the box against somebody. Right on. Yeah, I, I feel like one of the advantages of man, a lot of people, you know, kind of think that, oh, slants kill it and all these things kill it. And in a vacuum, that might be true. But when you have a league where some of the top users just really know how to beat zone coverages, like there's just not much you can do with a cover three or a cover two against the top users if you just do it play after play. Man, you kind of right. don't always know who's going to be open, right? Like, and if you're using, you can take away specific routes. So it's, you really, you talk about pressure. I mean, I would argue that's not just blitzing, but it's also pressure to make a read that isn't as obvious when it comes to who's going to be open. Well, and that's absolutely true because uh, like what you were saying with the zone, I mean, you can run cover three, cover four, anything you want. You face a good user. If there's no pressure on the quarterback, I mean, it doesn't even have to be uh, really in their face hitting the quarterback, but just the threat of the pressure, seeing that blitz coming, that's where bad decisions come from. I mean, if, if someone carves you up, as long as you can make the tackles, I mean, kind of like the Steelers in real life. Obviously, I'm a lifelong fan. Um, fuck Tyler, by the way. Um, if if you bend but don't break, I mean, I don't mind giving up 80 yards if I get an interception or uh, get a sack on third down. So when when yeah, sure, you might get carved up on a on a slant route, but I I have noticed you're not going to necessarily get burnt deep unless again there's a crazy mismatch. Like, for instance, I'm not putting uh, a safety that has 55 man uh, up against the slot receiver with incredible route running uh, simply because I know that guy's going to get burnt. But if it's, if it's even close, and I think I have a mismatch on the front seven somewhere, I'm banking on the fact that, sure, you might catch it. I might bend a little bit. But if you make one bad choice, especially, you know, being able to switch it up and then utilize uh, a different coverage. That's where man comes into me. I mean, it's, it might be my base, but you're able to get people off guard with your zones a little bit easier when they're used to seeing man. Lots of people considered man to be underpowered um, in online play because maybe they're used to playing as a computer or whatever, and they see how easy it is when the computer lines up in man, it's like an automatic, you know, first down, basically. Um, mm -hmm. You kind of backed up what I was talking about earlier which you haven't even heard yet for those listening, uh, where I was talking about that bend but don't break. Like you will give up those slants. You will give up some outs and things like that. But the idea is that you're, you're limiting them to field goals and eventually they're going to not convert a third down. Why do you think there's a perception that man is underpowered? Well, because I, I, I truly don't think that people are recognizing a lot of times when those mismatches are there. Um, if you have a cornerback who is a, a rookie, and he might be rated an 85 overall. But those those small things, play recognition, and, I mean, obviously man and zone coverage, not that zone applies, but the small ratings, your press rating, uh, a lot of times in the last cycle, actually, in, in hard at work, I was able to rely on being able to pressure the receivers outside. Um I think people people don't recognize those mismatches when if you have a guy with 68 press, um, a guy with high release, he's going to get off and get open. you got to recognize where you're weakest in the secondary. I mean, if they line up five wide short, you're not going to run cover zero. Um, but if it's, I mean, a two tight end set, they've got two options. Uh, you got maybe two safeties, one of them manned up on a, on a, fullback the other on a, on a running back there's a serious mismatch right there because it's it's one-on-one -on -one outside and i mean if they're running the ball it, odds are you're going to win that one and uh, again that goes back to the user middle linebacker skill so i think a lot of times people think it's it's mismatched because they're not recognizing where the the mismatches are on their own team awesome um 
So real quick, I have like two or three other quick questions I want to fire off mm -hmm. at you. Um, can you talk a little bit? Uh, you've alluded to it a little bit with some of the attributes. Can you, can you talk yep. specifically about the types of players you look for at each position? Yeah, and, and can, also actually... as a follow up, like where do you where do you want to spend your resources to so you can get elite talent since you obviously can't get it at every position? Of course, um, I can actually run through real quick because uh, I run the three four, and and with what you had said in your first uh, your first episode, which was a great episode, I I love this podcast. The the down lineman, my defensive tackle needs to be a guy that can take up a a gap on uh, either end just really eat up blockers you don't have to make tackles you don't have to make sacks just take up some space and let the linebackers take advantage of the gaps uh, almost the same thing with uh, the dn's big they don't necessarily have to be fast it's a plus every now and then madden blesses you with a big strong freak who can run a four nine or four eight or whatever but if they're big enough to uh to get off blocks and and make the tackles. The linebackers is where it's most important. Outside linebackers, this is where it's a little bit different than, than what happens in real life for me. What I look for is a Bud Dupree type. Somebody who's fast. Obviously, he's a pass rusher. But uh, when it comes to covering, I need somebody who's athletic because I'm going to allow that outside linebacker to drop into zones or drop into man coverage, even if it's for a little bit because I'm bringing pressure somewhere. Um, with what you said, where could I spend my resources to get elite talent? I want a Ryan Shazier type, um, somebody who is fast. The fastest position I'd like on the field is my middle linebacker. Obviously, that can't always happen. But I want my most athletic player to be my middle linebacker. Uh, that's, that's who I'm going to be using. That's who uh, is stuffing those run gaps because if you can't stop the run, you can't win in Madden. And then outside, obviously, elite cornerbacks elite safeties are nice but when it comes to safeties i do look at the free and strong um i like my strong safety to be almost a almost a linebacker cam chancellor type obviously he's elite but if if he doesn't have to necessarily be 90 plus speed uh, somebody that can you know have have what it takes upstairs you know above the shoulders all with all the play recognition and awareness but somebody who can tackle and then the free safety, he can be a little bit softer if he has to be, um, but somebody who can go play center field. Because a lot of times, sure, I run cover zero, but I also run cover one a lot as well. That free safety is generally the one dropping back. And then the outside, uh, I'm, a, I'm a speed guy when it comes to the corner because at least they can make up for it. But again, like I said earlier, I like press. I look at press. Everyone looks at man and zone, but I look at press. And interestingly enough, the one time I'm looking at strength besides D-line is my cornerbacks because I've noticed, and maybe this is just me speculating, but I truly think that a strength rating on a, on a cornerback, um, they might not be the fastest guy, but sometimes when they can jam a guy at the line, when you're playing cover zero, it, it definitely helps to have a strong guy outside. Yeah, there's no question. Strength strength matters a lot, and at least in Madden 16, drafted players came out like way too strong at the corner position. We'll <laughs> see if that bench press in 17. Um, <laughs> last question for you, and then I'll let you go. Um, Pre-snap adjustments. Can you get specific in terms of you know when are you making which adjustments? Um, how are you making your reads in terms of how to switch up what your what your pre-snaps are? Of course, um, running the three four, you can get deep when it comes to. Uh, the running game, if, of course, if you don't shade your line a certain way or if uh, make a certain stunt, I'm not, I, I feel like this can help a lot of users, and I know this is the point of the podcast. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. It's kind of that muscle memory on how to do it on a controller. But learn how to shift your D-line, obviously that, but learn where to direct your D-line. Pinch the line, outside pressure. Because uh, in a 3-4, if you have the right defensive lineman, they can at least hold the offensive line and allow your linebackers to attack the offensive line. I, I try not to sit in zones too much because I feel like users like Jordan, um, it, it gets to a point where they're attacking you. And when you switch it up and on second and, second and one, you come after them when they think that they have the time to go, you know, pass deep or something like that. If you attack the defense with a man coverage and you're blitzing, 
uh, those defensive stunts on the line, you can you can send linebackers right in. Now, obviously, so how are you determining team, which which direction? So you talk about shifting your line. How do you decide whether to go left, right, or or pinch? Yeah, uh, yep, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, strong side of the field. If you've played football, you you definitely know this. If not, you know the strong side of the field or the wide side of the field. Um, a lot of people like to run towards the wide side of the field, especially if it's an outside stretch play, toss play, something like that. They want that room. Um, you can kind of bait people with your defensive line to go do that if you know that they're going to be running towards the offense's right side, the, the defense's left side, and they'd be running at a Bud Dupree type, and you have space that you can really cover with your middle linebacker, that backside, that, that cutback, and depend on your outside linebacker to make a tackle, shift your D-line away from the wide side of the field, and maybe spread your linebackers out. Now, that's if you're using your middle linebackers appropriately, but you can kind of play mind games in that. But if you want to play the numbers game and you know that they're running a certain way, you know, shift your line to the right if you know they're running right. Now, if you don't want to shift your line, make sure that the, uh, the D-line is either crashing down if you think it's going inside. I mean, it's, a, it's kind of a guessing game, but that's where the chess map really comes in with Matt. That's awesome, man. I feel like we can go another 45 minutes on this just without even leaving man coverage if we if we wanted to. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but really appreciate it. That was really great stuff. That's exactly what I was hoping for. Um, I, I know as the season goes on, I'm going to every once in a while kind of uh, throw out an episode where we talk about, hey, what are we seeing since Madden 17 is going to be brand new? What kind of what kind of plays, what kind of offenses are we seeing and how to stop it? So I'd love if you could uh, kind of catch back up of with course. this at some later date uh, during season of one. Of course. All well, right, thank man. I appreciate you, appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, very excited. It. Have a good one, man. You too. All right, that's it for episode two. Hope you guys learned something. Uh, we'll be back sometime around next week. Uh, we're going to be going over cover two and Tampa two. So I'll talk to you next week.